that uh, it's nine o'clock, so we can uh, try to start uh, our session. I ask to the present uh, uh, speaker if they are present. So for the first uh, report, uh, number 68, uh, I don't see anybody. Maybe it's me, Fernando. Fernando, fine. Salvetti, present. Good morning. Yes. Yes, Very good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Behind you. So, uh, the first is present. For the second one, uh, that is uh, number 123, I saw Serena Ricci. It's okay? Yeah, good morning. Buongiorno. Good Serena. Very nice to see you. The third is uh, uh, Sara Capoccia, that I saw before, present. Sara, good morning. Thank you. Uh, after we have the fourth, uh, our number is uh, 134. Is present anybody for this uh, report? Hi, Agustin here. Hi. Sorry about the light. Joe Agustin, correct. Jose Agustin Albarazzi Damian, fine, I see you. Hi. And the last one is uh, 143, Katia Cortese, I saw before the... Good morning. Good morning, Katia, fine to see you. So, we can start. Uh, I think that uh, you uh, well know the, the type of presentation uh, we have, uh, and uh, we thank you very much, uh, Caterina Fusto, that is our angel for the today's session. Any kind of technical okay. problem will be solved by herself. And uh, if uh, uh, one of you, I mean the speaker, don't have uh, or are not able to present, uh, or to start the presentation that uh, will be made by Caterina. Uh, after the presentation, we have uh, at about five minutes for discussion, questions, and so on. And uh, so, if you are ready, we can uh, start. Thank you to be present. And uh, I think that will be a very nice session. So I give the speaker is the first. Uh, the title is uh, Digital Learning, Healthcare Training by Telesimulation and Online Cooperation. The speaker is uh, Fernando Salvetti and uh, it's up to you. Thank you, Marco. Hello, everybody. Uh, I have my video, if I'm not wrong, uh, I'm allowed to share 10 minutes video about uh, our paper, and then uh, I'm available in case of questions to, to try to provide some answers. So let me share, I think, my screen and start the video. Oh, I have to allow the sharing, the security settings are letting me this. Okay. You should see my screen and I can open. Please let me know if you can see the video so I can start. No, for now, I, I don't see your video. No. So, some, maybe now. Now it should be online. Yes, you have to. Okay. Fine. Good, All right, thank now you. We can see it very I, good. I can start. Thank you yes, so much. You are. 
there is no audio. Oh, uh, I do not know why. Is there some specific setting to allow for the audio? I ask maybe Katerina. Uh, you think I think you have to include sound before to share the, your video. Uh, Please try once where, again to share your video. But before uh, let, there are. Where I can find uh, the feature about sound because I am only finding uh, sharing video. Um, send me your video because uh, we have not your video in our sharing folder. I try to. I try to share your video by my PC. Uh, OK, where I can uh, send the video now? Uh, also to the um, to my email, Caterina Fusto. Caterina Fusto. I write to you here in the chat. Thank you. Send. Caterina Fusto. Okay, yeah. maybe the best is if someone other takes my place now. So no, I, I can send the video. Question. Yeah, I agree to you. So, Caterina, if you like, we can uh, carry on with the second. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Go ahead with the session. Yes, please. Thank you for understanding. Okay. All right, uh, Fernando, we go to the second. Uh, yes. That is uh, Serena Ricci. Yes. If uh, you can start. We agree with you. Sure. So let me just share the video and I'll be right to you. Okay. I think you can see the video. Yes, like, we can see the video. Now okay. it's back, but it's starting. Yep. So here you are. Fine. So, hello everyone. My name is Elena Ricci, and I will be presenting our work titled Crisis Research Management in Emergency Medicine, an Italian medical student experience. So, crisis research management is a training technique which has been used for more than 40 years um, for um, improving aviation safety. Um, it was born in the United States in the 80s from a collaboration between NASA and Air Force. Um, basically, CRM trains pilots on how to um, deal with emergency situations um, which are unlikely um, by relying on their previous knowledge and um, abilities. Also, it's strength um, management, communication, and priority definition skills. Um, so this technique has been transferred to uh, medical training, has aviation and medicine share many similarities in terms of unlikely events and stressful situation that must be managed properly and promptly. So CRM in medical training can be divided in three phases. Um, the first one is the presentation of the problem and it includes bibliography, clinical cases presentation and familiarization. It is then followed by high fidelity simulation lasting 20 to 45 minutes. Um, and it ends with a debriefing phase, which analyzes communication skills, leadership skills, and roles and priorities. Um, in order for a CRM course to be effective, um, some constraints must be respected. Um, first of all, training must occur in a high fidelity environment, which has to be as realistic as possible, as realism has been reported to increase um, skills acquisition. Um, also, clinical cases should be designed with increasing difficulty. Um, roles should be frequently rotated so that trainees can learn from different perspectives. Um, during the simulation, each group has a team leader and observers. And um, basically, during the debriefing phase, which is managed by an expert instructor, um, students have to follow the video recording of the simulation so that they can see and analyze trends and weakness of their actions can define errors and also if they want they can uh, starting from the uh, simulation comments they can report and analyze real life experiences 
Um, even though CRMB's courses should respect um, some um, features and uh, uh, constraints, they're still very heterogeneous in terms of standards, intervention, and effects. So in this context, our goal was to um, basically um, assess whether CRM can be suitable for um, Italian students. Um, to do so, we analyzed the fit of students who underwent a CRM course for emergency medicine. Um, and we also um, compared the um, responses of Italian students with those of foreign ones uh, in order to determine whether there are differences in terms of previous knowledge and experience. So the course was organized in 2018 by the um, Italian Medical Students Secretariat. It um, targeted uh, medical students one to three years um, prior to the degree. Um, it took a place in the high fidelity area of the Center for Advanced Simulation and Learning of the University of Genova, Italy, and you can see uh, the high fidelity area here in the slide. Um, the seminary started with uh, theoretical classes on emergency medicine basic procedures um, with particular attention to um, CRM in advanced cardiovascular life support. Um, the rest of the course was simulation um, oriented and specifically focused on how to simulate different techniques and situation. Um, at the end of the seminary, participants um, filled out a questionnaire um, covering all the aspects of the course, from the contents, the material used in the, in, during the course, to the instructor uh, knowledge level, basically. Um, as you can see, um, participant could respond um, on a scale, could rate on a scale from one to five, um, whether they agree or disagree with the sentence was presented. So let's get into the number. Um, 26 participants took part in our study and underwent the um, uh, CRM-based course seminary. Um, participants came from 10 different countries, 11 of them were Italian, and as their previous experience and backgrounds were different, we um, divided them in um, homogeneous groups. Um, so 30% of the students had some experience in emergency medicine. Um, interestingly, um, 40 to 50% of foreign students had previous experience with um, either medical simulation or um, CRM. Uh, and conversely, less than 20% of the Italian participants had previously attended basic simulation courses such as BLST. Um, a very interesting result um, concerned the fact that um, students didn't like being on these heterogeneous groups. So basically the courses was attended by uh, medical students with no clinical experience, but it was also attended by a paramed paramedics, a teaching assistant, an anesthesiologist, um, a disaster team member, um, and an intensive care um, intern. Um, we believe that um, this uh, like uh, diversity could have been an advanced value to the course, because novice learner can uh, could learn the basis of CRM, while skilled trainees could like observe beginners and grasp the criticism of training. However, this was not the case, as novice learner uh, felt sort of challenged, and expert found it distracting. <clears throat> So despite that, students like the setting and the, sim and the simulators and materials used, as well as the um, expertise level of instructors, as you can see here from the, um, this plot showing the results of the questionnaire, the past course questionnaire. So um, basically, this pilot study allows us to make <clears throat> consideration on CRM training in uh, um, medical emergency procedures. Uh, the most important is that the majority of Italian students had never experienced medical simulation prior to our seminary. Um, and this suggests that Italian universities are not giving enough importance and not paying enough attention to medical simulation, even though international literature agrees on its importance. Um, related to this, many students found it hard to transfer and apply academic knowledge in realistic scenarios. Of course, this is a preliminary study, uh, and these are preliminary results based on 26 participants from 10 countries. So it would be um, interesting and necessary to um, interview more, to enroll and interview more students. 
Um, however, this study further support the importance of um, investing in medical simulation to ultimately improve clinical practice. So I conclude my presentation with some pictures, which I believe um, better summarizes our results. So um, thank you for the attention, and um, I look forward to meeting you at the conference and response to any question you might have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Serena. Very nice presentation. And uh, did you like your presentation, your video? As oh, the... yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fine. Uh, of course, uh, if there is uh, any questions, uh, you are uh, is, uh, welcome for the from the audience. So I break the pre uh, please. So it's about, it's just a curiosity. So what is the reason that um, so why Italian students? Uh, don't feel uh, important simulation with respect to the foreign students. It's a cultural reason. Or... Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So I, so I don't. Basically, like my idea is that there are like two separate things to take into consideration. So first of all, um, it might be that uh, Italian students don't don't really know the like the potentialities of simulation. I mean, I know, like, I was super, so I'm not, in, like, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm an engineer, so super far from the environment. And I was, like, um, super curious to, like, understanding that many students didn't even have the basic, like, VLSD course. And I was, like, oh, that's so interesting. So they probably don't know, like, what simulation is. So they don't, they didn't, like, they cannot appreciate it because they don't know. Um, on the other hand, I think the problem is at the, at the top, so at, at the university level, because uh, it's not, like, simulation kind of, uh, is not well presented. Sometimes it looks like the extra part, like you have to study like tons of like books and you probably know better than me. And then, yeah, there is like practice, but you figure it out as soon as you became like doctors, surgeons or whatever. So I think it's like both hands. It's not known. It's not that it's not appreciated. Why, like abroad, um, they have to use it. Like there are like courses there already, like structured. And so they know it and they like it, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Understood. <laughs> Uh, I, I think we, we have uh, one trainees in uh, the School of General Surgery, Sara. And uh, what do you think about simulation in your training? Sara? Yes, I'm okay. Simulation is uh, very important for us uh, because it is the first approach to patient and uh, the setting of uh, the hospital uh, and when uh, it is uh, not so easy uh, to practice uh, our procedure before uh, uh, do it uh, in the reality. So it is uh, important and uh, in our uh, university simulation is a really good uh, instrument for us. Uh, with uh, our uh, uh, simulation center is uh, a good place to to learn. Yes, anyway, uh, the aim of the simulation center we have in our school uh, is uh, just to make uh, more confident students and trainees uh, with the simulation. And uh, I think that the the work is not uh, easy, but is uh, already started. So we hope uh, more confident uh, we have the students uh, more. Uh, and uh, mm, I think it's very important to to be confident in simulation to uh, acquire uh, sure to be sure during uh, the actual activity in the in the operating theater. Yeah, but again, Genova is a dreaming place because we do have the center is pretty big. I mean, students can go. I mean, it's getting better. I, I hope it's getting better and better. But there are like other universities in Italy. They don't even know what simulation is like. My, I mean, they know the basis. They didn't have like this like structure program. So again, how are results included also that part? So probably if we would have taken only like people from Genova, they would have been yes, of course we do. We use simulation. We know it. And but they, they, like the story is a little bit more complex than that. Right. Thank you, Serena. Thank you, Sara. Thank you, Katia.
And uh, I ask, uh, and of course, uh, thank you very much uh, to the other people. Uh, Fernando, are you ready? Uh, I assume that Caterina received my uh, video. So, Caterina, can you put on yes. the video of uh, Thank you so much again, and sorry You're for welcome, no this problem. You're welcome. By the way, I fully agree with uh, the former speaker about simulation in Italy. Genova is a really a landmark, maybe also the University of Eastern Piedmont with Simnova and a few others. But in many universities, medical schools mainly, it's very challenging uh, having a simulation taken seriously. Like it deserves. Yes. So, Caterina, if you like, we can start the video. Yes, in just a moment, I have a problem. If it's not working, we carry on with uh, the third uh, presentation. We are happy to be here with you today. No. This is an external voice. Yeah. The, the voice is right. <laughs> but do you don't see the... No. Before you were able to see the video, but not to release really the voice. Okay, now it should be. Let it's okay see. now. I can see the video. You you can hear. Uh, no. So I think that Fernando, if you if you agree, you can speak uh, online. Yes. Nice yes. your video. So let's, uh, let's uh, make start again from the beginning. Yeah. And Fernando, yeah. you will speak. Because uh, something speak. strange is happening. I'm talking on behalf of, of Roxanne Garner and Rebecca Maynard and Barbara Bertani. Uh, Barbara is uh, my business partner, uh, Roxanne and Rebecca, they are from the Harvard Center for Medical Simulation. And uh, maybe if Christina, please, if you can stop the video uh, so I can share some comment about uh, the images. I'm sharing uh, what we are doing in terms of telesimulation with the Harvard Center of Medical Simulation in Boston. So you can look at uh, online content and uh, at the same time, uh, at the mixed reality environment because we allow people to interact both online and sometimes into physical classrooms. This is mirroring a physical classroom and this is an online platform where people are expected to learn a checklist and mnemonic called the name claim name that is about the crisis resource management. Uh, Maybe we can go keep the, the video going if you can. Uh, okay, she was, uh, or better, she is uh, Roxanne, and uh, she was uh, recorded in order to deliver directly to you her greeting and some considerations about uh, this program. This program is uh, from the labor and delivery simulation activity where people are expected to learn how to manage unforeseen circumstances. In this case, uh, you can see um, the top uh, right side of my, at least my screen, uh, people from the international pediatric uh, event last year, learning for the first time uh, this uh, checklist and uh, trying to be compliant with this checklist in real time inside an alpine environment. Seems a little bit strange because there are videos um, mirroring or replicating something like an alpine environment inside a classroom because before coronavirus, what we did was uh, directly into a classroom. Now this is not 
uh, a classroom, but an online experience where people are exposed to some uh, information about the context. In a few seconds, uh, the injured lady is uh, appearing and they are uh, challenged at the end in order to find ways to uh, design and to execute an intervention in order to provide their help to this injured lady. Um, sometimes we animate the injured lady not only as a character, but as an avatar or let's say as a digitized human like a mannequin so we can provide answers to the questions uh, directly asked by the simulationists mm, like uh, if uh, they were facing uh, a real uh, talk and interaction with a real standardized patient or a real mannequin at the same time from the control room in this case roxanne may provide some uh, suggestions, some uh, cognitive help uh, using a post-it uh, or overlaying uh, keywords about uh, what is needed to be better known uh, or to better deal with by the people. Uh, this is uh, a second example. Mm, in this case, it's a CISAM 2021, the European event about uh, medical simulation is a mixed faculty, an international faculty, not only people from Boston, but also people from Spain, Switzerland, Canada, um, Belgium and Germany. Uh, they are performing uh, in a pretty different way, the same scene. I hope uh, that this video at the end of our event uh, could be made available just in case someone would be interested in taking uh, directly a look. Mm, there is the same uh, scene, I was saying, but there is an avatar mirroring the character. And uh, the avatar is pre-programmed in a way that uh, may understand, thanks to some basic artificial intelligence, key questions, because it's programmed to understand the keywords and to provide autonomously basic answers to the key questions. In case the questions uh, were uh, a little bit too tricky for the avatar. The same uh, Roxanne Garner uh, were and is uh, usually available from the control room uh, to animate the avatar and to provide uh, some more uh, answers, more articulated the, the real human uh, fashion and way, in order to be able to go further with the simulation uh, within uh, such an online environment, mixing uh, real human beings and uh, digitized human beings like uh, the avatars. And uh, in my opinion, uh, I can ask Katerina to stop uh, the video because uh, basically uh, these are uh, the key concept that the video was uh, recorded in order to be shared today. What, uh, in a nutshell, what we are doing uh, in Boston is uh, experimenting ways to uh, engage people into mixed reality environments that are glasses free. So people are not in need to wear special glasses or to use uh, special wearable helmets like joystick or gloves, in order to interact both uh, among themselves as human beings and with the digitized uh, avatar or avatars, because in other cases, uh, like we have another program about Kutaneus Rash, uh, we have more than one avatar interacting uh, uh, among themselves and with the human beings. So we are trying to experiment, let's say, telesimulation in different environments. We very prefer working uh, inside uh, digital classrooms, which it all uh, are at the same time physical and digitized classrooms, added with proximity sensors to enable uh, human interaction, gesture and touch interaction, and also vocal interaction. 
um, with uh, virtual contests as well as among uh, real people. Uh, mainly because coronavirus, we are experimenting also these 100% online uh, glasses-free platform. Thank you. Sorry again for uh, not being able to share and display directly the video. And uh, please uh, let me know if you have uh, questions or curiosities. Thank you, Fernando. Very nice. Uh, the live presentation uh, has been uh, very nice, very okay. Maybe better than the, uh, the video uh, recorded. So uh, the discussion is open. Any questions for the from the audience? I have one. Uh, it is very interesting that uh, the the simulation performance uh, does not uh, need the helmet or glasses. I well understood. Yes, and uh, may, uh, and uh, you are in an experiment phase, experimental phase of your product. Is correct? Uh? Yes, we are beta testing uh, in Boston and in a few other places, like in Washington DC, uh, within the healthcare school from the George Washington University. But uh, uh, the the student uh, or the trainees uh, can uh, use. Uh, this kind of product from uh, house and uh, uh, her himself? Yes, because uh, the platform is hosted online inside the Amazon Web Services Cloud. So they are provided with a link to the platform, they fill in their name, and they jump into the platform. So the, the platform is available online to pretty everybody with a minimum of technical requirements, the CPU of the computer. And uh, during the, the training, uh, there is, a, is there a tutor online available? Uh, yes, it's an instructor-led experience, because at least at this stage, we are not able to fully automate the, the experience. So usually the tutor is a Roxanne Garner or another tutor is a Rebecca Bynard. The two are from the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and Harvard Medical School. They greet the students. They introduce the name, claim, mail, checklist, and mnemonic. They check that all the students are aligned about the basics related to crisis resource management using this checklist. Then they leave the stage to the student. They have to perform three steps name, claim, and name, in order to face unforeseen circumstances like an alpine environment, like a car crash. We have approximately 20 different scenarios. Usually students are exposed to six different scenarios in 40 minutes. And each time they have to be compliant with the same checklist. This is the aim of the, this type of simulation. Thank you, Fernando. Any more questions? No questions? I'm thanking you for attending and uh, I'm available just in case by email. Very nice experience. So let's go on. And uh, the next one is uh, the next one singer is uh, Sarah. Sara Capoccia, the title is uh, Robotic Abdominal Wall Surgery, a single center training program for laparoscope endoscopy skillet surgeon, number 132. Sara, okay. please go Good on. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. I share my, my, share my screen. Okay, can you see the video? Yes, we can. Okay. 
Uh, I think we, we don't hear the audio. Mm. Try to start. You see, you speak, but we don't hear the audio. Mm. OK. So uh, if it's impossible to hear the audio, you can uh, speak lively. I, can I try to disconnect my... Okay. And you, you need to reshare, and when you share, you need to activate the onboard yeah. audio, the upper yeah. slider, exactly when you try to share your screen. Did you understand? Yes, yes. So share content and then you select the upper slider for the onboard audio. Then everything is fine. Okay, so I share. Sarah, don't worry, you can speak lively. Sorry, but there is no sound. There is no, no sound. sound. No Sorry, sound. Uh, Sarah, uh, please uh, start again and speak lively with direct voice. Did you listen to me? Sarah, you listen to me. So we can hear you. Microphone. No, there is Sarah. no voice. Which on your microphone? The microphone is on but not working. No. Sarah, uh, the best thing is, is uh, if you can start. Uh, Katerina, can you put on the, the video? Uh, there isn't in the sharing folder. If uh, Sarah can send me by email, I can share uh, later. I think the best solution is to go ahead with the presentations. In the chat, you can find my address email. OK, thank you. So, uh, during this uh, time, we can go on with the next one, I think. So, the next is Mammography CAD for system based, uh, CAD, uh, system based on transfer learning. Fine. The number is 134. And the speaker is ready. I see you. Jose Agustin. Yeah, hi. Uh, can anyone start. can see the video? Yes, we can see. 
Okay, thank you. You can start, of course, if you are ready. We cannot hear you. There is no audio in the chair. Yeah. I have posted it in the chat. You need to activate the onboard audio when you share. Uh, it's currently uh, the audio send it to you, but if you don't have any problem, I can put the slides and go the presentation. Yes, you can speak uh, lively, please, uh, Jose. Okay. Thank Let's you very start. much for your attention. Uh, anyone can see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Well, this work has been done with Oscar Garcia, Volodymyr Ponomaryov, Rogelio Reyes Reyes and Clara Cruz Ramos. Uh, this work has the name uh, Mammography CAT System Based on Transfer Learning. Uh, this transfer learning is from art artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning intelligence, and this work is done in Mexico in Instituto Politecnico Nacional. Uh, our, our contents are the following. Uh, as we know, introduction, the stats, uh, breast cancer is one of the most deadly diseases in the world. Uh, according to the WHO, uh, over 1 million people are diagnosed uh, every year, and almost half a million uh, are die from this disease every year. In Mexico, it's the leading cause from death, and that is the importance from the uh, eradicate this disease by the early detection. So as we know, as you know, maybe I think you are most medical uh, persons, more than engineering, uh, imagine studies can allow us to make a decision for the surgeon, for the specialist, to do a classification from the mass. Uh, as we know, the mammography is the first uh, study we can assure and almost if you can see any findings in the mammography, any other uh, imaging studies like CT, MRA, or PET or SPECT can be done. Finally, if we can detect any type of cells, uh, cancer cells, uh, we need to do a uh, histopathology. So for the patient is too uh, painful that surgery from the point of us. So that's the meaning of that's the way that we need CAT system solutions to provide you uh, the best way to do a classification from the mass. Uh, as we already know, the BRAT system uh, is a shame that allows uh, that classification only in the perception uh, features of the mass. As we know, the, in the table one, we can see the definition and the action. So, and the category of the rear rats. Uh, at, the th at the third uh, definition, we can see that the first ones are only for a benign class of masses. From the fourth to the sixth, it's only for the malignant classes where there is a compound of characteristics or perceptual, perceptual characteristics that we can uh, see in the mammography. So uh, as we already know, uh, a CAT system, a uh, software that can detect and only and, uh, and classify those uh, findings could head to the physician to make a decision to start an early uh, treatment or stay uh, close to the patient. In this case, uh, we have the mammography image, as we can see in the left of the diagram. Uh, then we apply a pseudo color phase where the perceptual, uh, perceptual findings are uh, highlighted. Therefore, we can uh, use a deep learning solution, in this case, artificial intelligence, that can extract those findings 
uh, from the image itself. The main course of this uh, software is that the the findings are based on the on the patterns that we find in the image. Later on, we can uh, use a software that can classify an algorithm that can, can classify those findings like a super vector machine. It's an algorithm that can uh, um, miss, um, I don't know what to say. Um, those findings, it can be classified as benign or as armaline. Uh, fi uh, as as finally, when well, as currently, we are gonna tell you what software do, does. This software do a, a segmentation to do to see only the perceptual uh, findings from the mammography. As we already know, the mammographies can contain labels, medical instrumentation, or others. So um, in this case, a manual cut of this image is being done. As you can see in the right of the image, it's only clear that the mama uh, itself, it's only in the picture against the left where we can see uh, some of the uh, labels as we uh, as we already know. A pseudo color algorithm uh, as, as quickly, it's based on these formulas based on the function trigonometric scene. And therefore we can see the concatenation of this image. As you can see in each image, we can generate a color based on the perceptual view of the image, of the original image. On the left side, we can see the concatenation of that. As you can uh, also see, the tumor is highlighted from the issue uh, and it's in, an, in a specific color. So in the case of uh, artificial intelligence algorithms, we use a uh, somewhere that it's called convolutional neural networks. Basically a convolutional neural network, it's a replica from a, a visual cortex. It extracts the patterns, uh, findings, or as you can see or uh, say, uh, any characteristics from several image. As we already know, uh, we can detect a, a laptop, a pencil, a pen, a book, and we already know that that information, but uh, a neural convolutional, no. So we train that algorithm to do this task. It's based on the transfer learning task. It's a, it's a machine learning task that the problem with the deep learning uh, approach of artificial intelligence is that we need a huge amount of data. In a huge, I mean thousands of thousands of images. As example, uh, ImageNet is currently a, a computer vision challenge where about 15 million images are trained in those models and they classify it in 1000 classes. But we don't have that amount of image. The, in a specific, the data set we use to this work, it's about 5,000 images. So what is uh, the gamble here? Uh, we use that uh, trained model from ImageNet and we modify it in a such a way that it can classify the findings of the mammography. As an example, uh, we already know how to do multiplications, how to read, but not, we, don't, we didn't born with that knowledge. It's based on someone who can tell us that to do that. It's like the that's kind of thing in the, in this in this in this artificial uh, technique. So uh, for the convolutional neural network, we use NASNet, which is one of the top class uh, ImageNet based uh, classification with a 82.7 accuracy uh, level. Uh, it can classify uh, without a problem any type of this image. And finally, we adapted to uh, our specific task, which is the classification of mammography. Uh, 
in some of the algorithms you said here, we use a uh, GradCam. This GradCam algorithm allows to visualize the relevant features obtained from the, the deep neural network. As you can see in the picture in the first one left, it's the mammography, and second one, it's the heat map. This heat map is the features that the neural networks can see, and it's relevant from uh, their point of view. In the final image is the uh, superposition, superposition of the lost image. As you can see here in C, uh, some of the features based on the uh, of the mass of the nodule are highlighted because they are findings for the network. Uh, this uh, findings can be refined over the training, but as we already do in this work, it's only based in one uh, symbol uh, training. Uh, finally, those train those the features are extracted and therefore are reduced uh, using the PCA component analysis algorithm, which is a statistic uh, algorithm to uh, compact for some kind of words. The features uh, use it. Uh, and here we you we reduce from 4,000 to 400. So it's a what kind of relevant uh, reduction. Finally, as we did, as we told you, uh, we use a super vector machine classifier that discriminates one class uh, features against other class fe uh, features. Uh, in this case, we use the RBF kernel and the idea is to make a hyperplane between the data extracted from the convolutional neural network and draw a hyperplane that divides the data. As the experimental results, we use two data sets. It contains, as, as I already tell you, about 500 images. This one is the first one, the DSM data set. Uh, the table two is the image contained in this data set. Therefore, a uh, University of Chicago Medical Center data set. There are these kind of images. Finally, as quality criteria metrics, we use accuracy, uh, sensibility, uh, specificity, precision, and F measure. Uh, as in experimental results, using the DDSM uh, data set, we obtain about 80, 88% of accuracy and area under the curve about 94%. As you can see here uh, in the confusion metrics uh, uh, graphic, uh, we only fail 18 images and seven fr from each class. Therefore, we use uh, a technique just uh, named CAFOLD in which the data set is divided in K divisions and then the classifier it's train it in K minus one divisions, and the last one is the, the test remaining. So uh, as R under the curve, we obtain a mean R under the curve of 97. In the UEC, it's the similar results, about 97% of accuracy, and a K-fold validation of 83. This is the comparison against the state of the art, where as we clearly see, we are above in some metrics, such accuracy, sensibility, uh, precision, and later. Finally, as conclusions, uh, very quickly, uh, we designed this CAD system to support the vision, uh, the perception of the medic to do uh, clearly an early diagnosis. Uh, evaluating this method with the metrics uh, before mentioned, we can state that the CAD system is a low resource and efficient to do this task. Finally, as limitation, the is as a, as example, if a physician want to uh, add some view, as example, left, right, uh, I don't know, oblique or horizontal, the system needs to be retrained. Also, if the physician wants to add some class, Again, we need to retrain the system. As a future work, we need to employ these systems in, health, in public health facilities. And also we want to do a CAD system employing those neural networks 
to determine the virus stage from the lesson. Also, this needs also needs to do with the physicians and get the uh, the necessary data to do this kind of work. Uh, without all say, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Also, thank you for for this work to the Instituto Politécnico Nacional and Consejo Nacional de Tecnología. Uh, that's all for me. If anyone have any questions, do go ahead. Well done. Very nice uh, report, very nice work. Any questions from the audience? I have one for you. Uh, is there, yeah. is, is this a uh, uh, tool, uh, is one for um, physician or for, for trainees? Uh, well, it can be done for both because for physicians, uh, we need to do a specific um, labor with them, uh, with trainings also. Uh, also, uh, as example, uh, really my work is based on mel melanoma. As we know, melanoma uh, it's ruled by ABCD rule. So the problem with the ABCD rule is that the physicians or trainings can be uh, precisely apply this rule. So we need tools that can help a second, uh, second opinion. Uh, this uh, rule, as example, or other type of rule or other type of tools, uh, this is the uh, kind of uh, way to do this tool, to bring a second opinion to the event surgeon, a specialist, physician, training. Right. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Cosette. Uh, can you put thank off you very much, the sharing? So, uh, sure. Fine. And uh, so now if uh, Sarah is uh, ready to go, I ask also Katerina. I sent the video. I cannot hear the audio. Uh, options of uh, can I try on once again? Of course. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to present our work about learning the abdominal wall robotic surgery. As Charles Darwin said, each animal species evolve to survive. And surgeons too has been evolved from open surgery to robotic surgery. In abdominal wall repair, laparoscopy didn't really overcome open surgery because technical difficulties. But thank you to the opportunity by robot of replicate the same gestuality of open repair. This promise to join together benefits of open surgery and laparoscopic surgery in abdominal wall repair. In last few years, a robotic abdominal wall surgery became a trend topic with over 300 papers published on PubMed. Like this meta-analysis published on hernia in 2019 that demonstrate that robotic abdominal wall surgery is feasible, safe and effective as a laparoscopic and open approach. With the same benefits of minimal invasive surgery, as lower incidence of complication and faster recovery for, for patients, but at higher cost. So we proposed our project to general surgeons already skilled in laparoscopic abdominal wall procedures in our setting of Policlinico San Martino in Genova, with a curriculum of learning of abdominal wall surgery with Da Vinci robot, 
composed by one preclinical and clinical sessions with increasing difficulty procedures. Our aim is build an educational model feasible, safe and proposable for other hernia centers to improve the use of robotic platform for advanced procedures in hernia surgery. The preclinical step is composed by educational videos, dry lab, wet lab and virtual simulation in two sessions per week, three hours each, for one month of duration of this step. The objective is to reach the, learn, the, the knowledge of basic skills and gestuality, gain confidence with the robotic console and docking of robot. The class session is divided in two steps. The first one is focused on inquinal hernia repair, and the surgeons start with uncomplicated primary inguinal hernia repaired with TAP approach. After 25 procedures, can start with complicated TAP repair of recurrent hernia or in complicated patients. The skills required is this dissection in a familiar space for surgeons, simple gesture for mesh placement, and a single simple suture to perform. The objective is helps the surgical equip to acquire confidence with robotic abdominal learning repair and for surgeons to gain, to gain confidence with robotic instruments in a simple setting. The second step of the clinical step is focused on ventral learning repair. There are four types of repair proposed as IPOM, ETEP, TARUP and TAR with parastomal hernia repair, with increasing complexity. The surgeons start with IPOM repair of, pri of primary small ventral hernia, with an intraperitoneal mesh position, and after this, can start to repair primary and incisional ventral hernia with diastasis rectis, and um, complex abdomen and parastomal hernias with the mesh put in the retromuscular space. Skills required for this step is the use of device of me for mesh placement, adhesiolysis, dissection of the retromuscular and preperitoneal plane, large mesh placement, multiple running sutures for midline reconstruction and stoma preservation. The objective are master following steps with incre increasing difficulty to perform more complex procedures, complete the curriculum to gain confidence in complex ventral hernia repair to maximize the benefit of robotic surgery. Surgeons start with this step after three weeks of TAP repair, and after nine weeks of IPOM repair, can start with ETEP, TARUP, and TAR repair. In conclusion, it has been demonstrated that the robotic approach reduces complications and pain compared to laparoscopic and open surgery with the same efficacy in hernia repair. Our curriculum aims to achieve the learning curve for robotic hernia repair, but more data should be collected for validation. Achieving the learning curve for surgeons already skilled in laparoscopic procedures for hernia repair has been demonstrated that it is feasible in less than 100 procedures overall. Completing this curriculum and propose that in other hernia centers can improve the robotics um, techniques for hernia repairs and really get benefit minimal of minimal invasive and open surgery joined together. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Sara. It's okay. Nice presentation. Any <laughs> questions for from the audience? Right, uh, one uh, uh, from the chair. Uh, do you think that the robot is uh, a very important uh, benefit uh, for the patient in the whole uh, uh, pathology? Yes, um, the robot device uh, has uh, the advantage of drawing together benefits of minimal invasive approach to abdominal wall repair 
and the possibility to replicate the same virtuality of open repair and complex procedures in uh, large incisional hernia or in complex abdomen that are particular difficulties to uh, surgeon to repair these patients. So the, uh, the patient has uh, mean, um, minor complication uh, uh, compared to uh, open uh, procedures and a faster recovery to return uh, to the normal activity and uh, the normal life. So the robot is a very good device for us. Fine, thank you. Any other questions? Right, so now we can go to the last presentation that is a, a Proust-like questionnaire for anatomy distance learning, a report on the experience of the first year of pharmacy under Gary uh, The number is 143 and the speaker is Katia Cortese. All right, good morning. You can put on your video, please. Yes, just a second. Try to put uh, high the audio, please. I don't see any screen, no. Yes, we can see your okay. slides. Okay, let's start. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate to the International Multidisciplinary Modeling and Simulation Multiconference. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, a questionnaire that we have administered to the first year pharmacy student, which is a Proust-like questionnaire for distance learning. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, what are the results of the experience of these students. So let's briefly introduce myself. My name is Katia Cortese, and I'm a professor of human anatomy at the University of Genova. I teach human anatomy to pharmacy students and chemical pharmaceutical students. Below, you can see Marco Frascio, which is the other author of the study, at work, so at the surgery department of the University of Genova. Everybody knows that the pandemic has changed our lives. And so the university education, especially the medical education, did not make an exception. The pandemic indeed imposed deep modifications to the anatomical and surgery education and the educational practices. Um, indeed, many students, the overall population of students actually, lost access to the other learning modalities that we were used to, like to look at museum specimens, like to, to check the bones and the microscopic slides in the laboratories. This transformation has not been easy for students, but also for us, for teachers. First of all, I want to say that this study was designed as a proof of principle study, and uh, we wanted to evaluate, in particular, the emotional challenges and the emotional experiences dealt by the first-year pharmacy students during the distance learning of human anatomy. In particular, we aimed at understanding the physical and mental learning conditions and also their perception on the value of human anatomy for their future, for their career in the future. We think that the digital learning may also continue in the post-pandemic future. So uh, we think that the feedback, even if it's still a proof of principle study, may, have, may help to design better anatomy course and also maybe a surgery course or medical courses in general 
in, in this uh, learning modality. We proposed in this study a modified post questionnaire to the students of the second semester in, of the academic year 2020-2021. What is the Proust Questionnaire? So the Proust Questionnaire has its origin in a partner game, which is popularized but not devised by Marcel Proust. Marcel Proust was believed that by answering those questions, the individuals, the subjects, may reveal their true nature. So we designed um, 12 uh, items, uh, 12 questions designed based on a Proust Questionnaire and uh, these questions were delivered to, to the students willing to participate to this study to, through our institutional Microsoft Teams platform. 50 students who have actively attended the online anatomy course have been included in this survey. The redemption was about the 76%. 32 female and 6 male participated, and the students belonged to the age group from 19 to 22 years. There was complete anonymity of the trainees, and the data were collected using Excel in the Microsoft Office package 2007. And here you can see the 12 questions of the cruise like questionnaire that we delivered to the students. So, which is the main trait of my character that suffers in the distance? The trait of my character that benefits from the distance? How do I leave the cosmic emptiness inside the screen? What do I appreciate in distance learning? What do I use the current technology to improve my study? What is the greatest accident that has happened or that I fear while attending an online uh, lesson? What learning technology would I like in the future? What gift of nature would I like to possess to overcome the distance? What are the other students doing on the other side of the screen during a, a lesson? If there was no distance, would I be more or less interested in attending a face-to-face -face course? Today, there will be an online anatomy class. How do I wake up? And lastly, in, our, in your opinion, is the study of anatomy relevant for your future work? So now I'm going to show you some of our interesting results. The vast majority of students mainly suffered from the lack of interaction and socialization with teachers and other colleagues. And of course, they also declared that they missed sport activities. But distance learning also offers some uh, emotional advantages to them. For example, from shyness, 27%, from anxiety, and also they, they said that they have more possibility to dedicate time to family affection. How they deal with the screen, with the cosmic emptiness, with the computer screen? 36% did not understand the question. That was a shame. Twelve percent replied they have they had difficulties to cope with it. 32-33% tried to concentrate on the lesson and do not think to the screen. And the 18% tried to camouflage with it, whatever it means. Surprisingly, the, first, the majority of students greatly appreciated the possibility to attend both the online live classes and also the recorded lesson at WIT. This was an important point. And the 24% the um, enjoyed the possibility to attend the lesson without traveling, and so in the comfort of their homes. 13 um, percent appreciated the easier organization of their time. About the current technology, they think that 68% uh, take advantage of internet using Google search, YouTube videos, and many other resources that are on the web, like also Wikipedia. 
um, 59% fear the, curiously, the interaction of the Wi-Fi connection during the online class or during the exams. And also, the 40% fear an accidental turning on of the microphone or the camera. Only one student feared a personal invitation from the teacher to actively participate uh, to a discussion. What do you think about the technology for the future? Many of them would like a more powerful and more stable internet connection. Only 13% are technology with mm, virtual assistant like Google Siri and Amazon Alexa, but designed especially for students' questions. Only 10% are satisfied with the current development. And uh, the 11% would wish the possibility to attend the university only by using online courses. 29% don't know uh, what to respond. When asked on what, what kind of natural gifts they would uh, have to overcome the distance, they responded, the majority responded to improve their ability to concentrate for a long time on the computer. And 22% uh, imagine the teletransportation technology, 19 don't know, and the 11% wish the complete vaccination of the worldwide population in order to avoid any distance in the future. And uh, when asked about what, what do you think about the other students, what they are doing now while attending the online class? 41% think that, like themselves, they are coping with the situation in the same way. So taking notes and trying to concentrate. 19% have concern about the mental concentration. And 23 don't know, but they are, they are curious about knowing what the other students, what is the other students' mood. And the question, do you prefer face-to-face -face or distance learning? 53% will be happier and more interested to face-to-face -to -face anatomy classes due, due, in their opinion, to easier interaction with the teacher and companion. But uh, 53 is not is a, a bit half, more than half of students. While 42%, like mostly 43%, declare that they do not feel any difference between the two teaching modalities. When they have been asked on how they wake up in the morning, waiting for a full day of distance learning, 68% replied completely relaxed and confident. So they are quite well in this situation. Why the 31.6% perceive indolence and increase in lack of motivation. So we have two population of students. Uh, the majority are coping well with the, the distance, so they reply the relaxed and confident, but uh, another population perceives indolence and, and a progressive lack of motivation. So in conclusion, the take-home message of this uh, proof of principle study is that distance learning is progressively accepted by our students, at least the, the, the sample of students of this study. As a strength, the online of the online teaching modalities, we report to listen to record the lesson at will, which is particularly important for working students, and also to avoid uh, long traveling and all the related costs in terms of money and time spent to reach the university. As a weaknesses, we report the lack of interactions and socialization with educators and companions and also the lack of emotional sharing with them. So in conclusion, we would like to propose to administer this survey also to other category of students, both medical and non-medical students, to strengthen the significance of the current results. Because would be, it would be interesting to, to examine whether other category of students feel and perceive the, the learning um, the online learning modalities in different ways. So thank you very much for your attention. Hope you enjoyed this short talk. Thank you very much again.
Thank you very much, Katia. And uh, is there, uh, can you put off the sharing? Thank you. Are any question from the audience, please? I have a question for Katia. All right, please. About uh, emotional uh, support. Do you think, uh, do you envisage uh, ways for online learning aimed at supporting in a better way compared with the today's available solutions, uh, emotions and uh, social related issues? We try to, that's it. that is a good question. And uh, at the moment we, we are again uh, doing a transition between uh, only online teaching and now again in, in presence. And uh, we will see um, if the emotions are going better than, than before. But I tried, at least this is my experience, I tried to involve them uh, as much as possible during the, the courses to, by asking questions, basically, but also performing small survey during the course, like this Proust um, questionnaire, but also other kind of small, very like five questions after, and after uh, four or five um, uh, lessons and about how they learn, how they doing. I often ask them to, to, to talk during my, my two hour class. For example, the, I designed one of them to, uh, to remind me to, to record the, the lesson because I forgot. I forget I have many, many teaching courses, so I don't always, I don't, uh, I, for, I forget always something to do. So one, one student reminds me what to do, and, and uh, so I try to involve them in, in different ways. And, but um, I, I noticed that there was a progressively lack of interest anyway during the, the, the overall course. So we started with 100 students connected and we, I, I concluded with 30 students connected. And also on this survey participated only a fraction of the overall students and especially female, which are often much more motivated than males. I don't know why <laughs> exactly. So it's not easy to it's not easy to respond. It's not easy to it's a new situation for everyone. So. I imagine it's a tricky, it's a really a tricky situation. Thank you so much. Very useful. Some very useful insights. Maybe you can propose this questionnaire to your students. But uh, I do not really have students because we only serve uh, different communities of simulationistas. So I'm, I'm trying to understand because I'm uh, wondering about uh, online learning a lot because it is one of the solutions that we propose, but uh, socialization, emotional uh, uh, related aspects are really challenging. So. Yeah, it, it depends also on the, the age of your um, of your students or um... oh, our uh, age span is in between uh, 16 18 uh, till uh, 60 because we are uh, in the high school uh, we are at the college level uh, uh, postgraduate uh, university studies and the lifelong learning medical simulation and management so it's really uh, very different ages but all the students, in, in our opinion, they, they need support. Uh, and I do not know which type of uh, facilitation in order to socialize better online. It's very tricky. Actually, in our, uh, now I recall, in our university has been uh, open um, an office for psychological support for students uh, during the lockdown and also in this uh, post lockdown time and we have so this uh, psychological support office 
uh, with a green with a number telephone number in which students can um, book an appointment and talk with a psychologist if if they have a, a real uh, um, real um, emotional challenges so. got it thank you So, very nice discussion, thank you very much. And uh, so now we are going straight to the conclusion. We are perfectly on time. I have uh, to thank you very much. Uh, we stumbled uh, and tripped uh, with uh, some uh, technological problem, but uh, we overcame uh, very nicely. Also, thank you to our angel. Caterina, and uh, thank you to Fernando Salvetti, to Serena Ricci, to Sara Capoccia, to José Almaraz Damian, and uh, to Katia Cortese. Uh, Caterina, thank you very much for your organization, for your help. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much to everybody. Now the session is uh, concluded. Thank you again, and see you in Rome, I think, personal in presence. Thank you and bye bye to everybody. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.